Muy buenas tardes a todas y todos. Good eh, afternoon, everyone. I would like to open hearing number eight of the 184 period of session of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, which is entitled Situation of Freedom of Expression in Venezuela. The hearing was requested by several civil society organizations. My name is Julissa Mantisha Falcon. I am the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And today with me are Commissioner Estuardo Rallon, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena, and Commissioner Carlos Bernal, who is a reporter for persons with disabilities. Also today with us is a special rapporteur for freedom of expression, Pedro Vaca, and the assistant executive secretary of the commission, Maria Claudia Pulido. I would like now to explain the distribution of time. We will have a first round of interventions by civil society organizations for 20 minutes, then the state will have 20 minutes, then the commission will participate for another 20 minutes, and we will have another second round of interventions of 12 minutes each. Having said this, I would like to give the floor to civil society organizations. Please introduce yourselves and bear in mind the timer on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marisabel Rodriguez. I'm a researcher in the Human Rights Center of Universidad Católica. Venezuela is facing a structural crisis and we see that it's having an impact on human rights between 2020 and 2021. This situation was worsened by the pandemic. The worsening of the health crisis led to restrictive price, uh, practices in terms of political and civil rights. We also see that there were several persecutions because of political reasons. We have focalized persecution systems against public officials, union leaders, human rights defenders. And this lead to a closure of the civic space. Over 10, um, several public officials were detained because of criticizing public administration. One of them was Adam Maguire, a nurse who was detained in July, 2021. And she was accused of promoting hatred and terrorism. She was released 12 days later because of a precautionary measure. Eri Tiro, union leader of the Federación Unitaria de Trabajadores de Venezuela, he was detained a year and five months after denouncing corruption acts by, committed by oil company PDVSA. He was accused of terrorism and he was released because of a precautionary measure in April this year. The persecution against activists, activists and leaders of political parties continues. Over 30 persons were submitted to different punishment um, situations in 2022. In June the 4th, a group of activists from the Socialist Party um, uh, were attacked in an event uh, to which Juan Guaidó was going to attend. Later, a group of activists was attacked because they were protesting for the murder of another activist who was murdered in 2017. The activists were accused of blocking uh, roads and that they were associated to commit crimes. The former governor of Táchira, Ms. Gomez, said that she was um, complained or she received a complaint uh, by Bernal. Bernal is requesting $12 million for compensation. The court of the metropolitan area of Caracas decided to start a trial against Mr. Zavallos a prosecutor in San Cristobal, he was accused of promoting protests in 2014. Eight years later, Sebastio was in different detention centers and he was excarcerated or released in 2018. We see different attacks on civic spaces and this affects human rights organizations. We see that there are 
violations of the right to freedom of association. In January 2021, one of the organizations was um, searched by different agents. Also, the members of the organization were prosecuted. They were released because of precautionary measures in February 2021. In July uh, 2022, the director of another civil society organization will go to trial because he is accused of promoting hatred. Recently, the governor of the state of Carabobo, Rafael Acaba, denounced criminally two persons for alleged defamation after they presented several extrajudicial executions by state authorities. Also, these crimes are used to criticize public officials. There is also a project to regulate social media. And in this context, this could promote repression for civil society organizations and population in general. The bill on international cooperation is adva has advanced and it's aimed at threatening the existence and independence of civil society organizations. If it's passed, it would allow the executive branch to manage different resources and will lead to the creation of a record of civil society organizations. Also, this violates the right to freedom of association. This will also affect the indirect and direct beneficiaries of aid programs in vulnerable situations. Saying thank you so much. Now I would like to give the floor to one of my colleagues who is here today. Diego Ponce de León. Good afternoon. My name is Diego Ponce de León. I am here on representation of an NGO, and I would like to talk about the situation of freedom of expression in 2021. Just one second. To begin with, it's important to say that in 2021, at least 41 arbitrary detentions were recorded in the country. Most of those detentions were journalists or social communicators. Also, we identified 87 acts of harassment, 39 cases of violations towards classical media outlets. This is press, radio, and TV. And we are concerned about six violations against the right of property of communication media. Uh, we are talking about newspaper El Nacional. This is a violation of the obligation of respect, which implies that there should not be attacks against Media. Also, the Observatory on Social Conflicts recorded in 2021 at least over 6,500 demonstrations, which led to 107 detained persons, 10 injured persons, and one martyr. And citizens have not had the possibility of accessing information. In 2021, due to the lack of energy, we see that there were several cases of uh, lack of energy in homes, and therefore many people in the country do not have access to internet because of the electricity cuts. And this goes against the international standards in order to guarantee freedom of expression. There is use of force in protests, and there is not an environment to guarantee the exercise of this right. With regard to the obligation of adopting measures at the domestic level, it's important to take into consideration the ruling Olmedo Bustos et al. against Chile, which talks about the 
El uh, Estado ha de adoptar todas las medidas para que el transito en la Convención sea efectivamente cumplido por el Ministro Interno, tal como lo requiere el artículo 2 de la Convención. Dichas medidas son solo efectivas cuando el Estado adopta su transición a la normativa. La domestic legislation is adapted to the Convention, as requested in Article 2 of the Convention. And in 2019, since 2019, Venezuela has received over 38 recommendations in terms of freedom of expression by international organizations. Desde especially taking into consideration the recommendations de, of the Inter-American eh, Commission of Human Rights from 2019 and 2021, and also fecha, from the working group of the catas, Universal, eh, Universal Periodic Haciendo Review. But those sobre, recommendations eh, have not been addressed so far. Emitido, Regarding que, the reports eh, issued by the Commission, it's important to take into consideration that the six recommendations regarding changes in legislation are maintained, especially those actions that promote hatred. De forma continua en el país. A modo de conclusión, los datos uh, de los datos 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 de los Self-censorship in Venezuela. We can understand that self-censorship is something when people abstain from comment on information because the fear and that it could lead to actions against them just because they are expressing. This was mentioned by the special rapporteur for freedom of expression of the Inter-American Commission together with the rapporteur on freedom of expression of the United Nations in 2019. They defined this in 2019. Uh, taking into consideration the special report on self-censorship, we can say that 93% of, of 700 people who were surveyed considered that freedom of expression cannot be exercised freely in the state of Venezuela. 70% of the population said that they have practiced self-censorship on social media. And this is because of the measures taken by the state through the public prosecutor's office. They order detentions because of comments on social media. And also, many people decided to um, practice self-censorship in order to avoid detention. And also, 62.3% of those surveyed have affirmed that they prefer self-censorship in order to prevent any attack towards or against their personal integrity. When we asked the population if they feel fear, 47% indicated that they felt insecure when exercising their right to access to information. We see that there are several mechanisms to prevent the exercise of freedom of expression. This includes self-censorship and other mechanisms that undermine thoughts and freedom of expression. Thank you so much. Thank you. We share with the Commission a, a report on the situation of freedom of expression, and the report includes the, the conclusions or the consequences of a state policy that restricts freedom of expression in Venezuela. We have a map on media outlets in the country, and we decided to do it because we have no official data. And we uh, identified 980 media outlets in Venezuela. 71% of them are radio stations, 10% are TV channels, and there is also another 10% that are digital platforms. Newspapers in Venezuela were 105. Now there are only 24 who are operating. Those 24 newspapers work weekly or some days every week. This is because of the censorship of the regulating entity. And although in Venezuela, 
we report the closing of TV stations, radio stations, and media outlets, we can say that there are 50, 45 online platforms that are blocked. So if you want to enter an online platform, you need to make an effort. You cannot buy a newspaper in a store or they will have to learn new instruments in order to avoid censorship. This is a key component to understand why we consider that is relevant the role of CONATEL, the regulating entity, because they are preventing the possibility of having free access to information. This is a key element. And also at a local level, there is no information. In Venezuela, there was a group of local media outlets who have disappeared. There are states in Venezuela that do not have independent media outlets. And another important element has to do with criminalization. We are seeing that the law on hatred has been used to criminally persecute uh, communicators. This is not a law according to us because it's not a pass according to what is established in the constitution. And we are identifying several cases of arbitrary detentions. So we are seeing a reduction in the free movement of information in the digital space. We are seeing a lot of blockages in the digital space. They are promoted by the government, but also those are promoted by internet companies who are not being held accountable for those uh, blockages. There is another important component that should be added to all this that creates a very hostile environment for journalists uh, in Venezuela. There are several journalists that are being uh, judicially persecuted. Some of them are out of the country, but they are still subjected to judicial proceedings. And also we have criminal persecution, which is very strong. We do litigation and we support highly complex cases. Sometimes the files are not available. It is not possible to document all the violations of the process of law. And we see high violations of the rights of those who are subjected to these proceedings. They cannot leave the country. They suffer a high level of uncertainty about the proceeding. All these elements made us think that it's very important because the spaces where information is being circulated are internet, social media, and some um, communication mechanisms such as WhatsApp. And those spaces are now being under attack. This week, there was a person who was criticizing on WhatsApp and the law on hatred is being applied or enforced against this person. We are seeing these cases not only in the capital city, but also across the region. Those are the most important elements that we would like to indicate or to point out. Uh, we have shared with you our reports, but before concluding, we would like to thank the commission for following up on the situation in Venezuela. For us, it's very important that the commission continues to understand and to study the situation of human rights in Venezuela, since there are new bills, new laws, um, especially against those people who are using those small spaces to exercise freedom of expression in Venezuela. So all the cases related to censorship promoted by the regulated entity are very important. Please uh, bear in mind the cases that we report before you. You are a very important element to make the situation of the country visible abroad. And taken into consideration the request of my colleagues, it's important that you discuss all the issues related to self-censorship. This is a phenomenon that occurs in Venezuela, but it has a regional impact. We will stop here. So we have the possibility of answering the questions that you may have or the comments that you have. Thank you so much. Agradeciendo su presencia. We will now give the floor to the um, 
state representatives. Thank you, Ambassador, for being here. You have 20 minutes. You're muted, Ambassador. I apologize. I'm not great with technology. That's why I was delayed, and I apologize for that. Madam President of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, commissioners, friends of the um, rapporteur, uh, friends of the Inter-American Commission, rapporteur for freedom of expression, and a big hug to my friends from the civil society whom we have just heard. Uh, even though I couldn't hear you all, I did listen to some of your presentations. First of all, I would like to thank you on behalf of Venezuela's permanent mission and uh, the Espacio Público Mundo Sin Mordaza for having requested this meeting, this hearing, as well as the commission for having it considered it pertinent for uh, the situation of freedom of expression in Venezuela. Um, as Catalina Botero, a former uh, rapporteur for freedom of expression, said that in 2010, the American standards, the inter-American standards on freedom of expression did not were not generated spontaneously but because authoritarian regimes violated them. And this is important because the position of the interim government in Venezuela is to recognize the legitimacy of the uh, court and the, com on the um, convention, commission, sorry, as they are, uh, safeguard for the respect for human rights in the region. The last time we discussed the situation with the commission was in May 2019, in the 172nd period of sessions. That was what, before the pandemic. And as you know, ever since, hundreds of violations against journalists and others have taken place. Many of them were addressed by these organizations. And our mission would like to um, think of several cases that shocked our country. On April 16th, 2021, the Supreme Court of Justice of Venezuela, by usurping the jurisdiction of other organizations, ordered the newspaper El Nacional to pay a compensation of $137 million for allegedly having um, lied about Mr. Diosdado Cabello after replicating uh, articles from the US and Spain, which linked Mr. Cabello to drug trafficking activities. These, uh, the uh, lawsuits against the news outlets in their countries were uh, dismissed. And Nacional was born in August 1943. It survived uh, the uh, dictatorship of Marcos Perez Jimenez. It lived four years of democracy and then 20 years of Chavism and Magyarism. 77 years after its foundation on February 8, 1922, sorry, 2022, a judge gave Diosdado Cabella the uh, seat of the newspaper. That was his intention since $137 million is an absurd amount whose payment could only be ensured by seizing the uh, property of the newspaper. In a rule of law, the citizens and the mass media should be able to criticize uh, the government and its officials, and they should be expected to do so. But being a journalist in uh, Venezuela is a high-risk activity. That is the case for many journalists in Venezuela. One of them investigated for many years businessman Alex Sagain. And one day before Mr. Sagain was extradited to the US, the journalist was arrested um, for uh, instigating crime. He was just doing his job. And access 
and his public investigations made the government uh, want to investigate him and seize him. Since he was out of the country, his family, his brother was detained in his place. Human rights defenders also suffer the consequences of the loss of spaces for freedom of expression. In June 2021, the director of Fundarredes was arbitrarily detained by the intelligence service. In the uh, previous months, Carazona documented human rights violations taking place in his state by the um, and also the human rights violations and armed uh, conflicts between the revolutionary forces and the Bolivarian uh, forces in Venezuela. A high number of uh, the armed forces of Venezuela were held hostages by the FARC, and this was pointed out by um, the journalist and the machinery of political propaganda decided to harass him. He was arrested. He is now suffering health issues. He is incarcerated and all this because he documented sensible information as was called. In Venezuela, Regular citizens are persecuted as well and incarcerated when their ideas and convictions do not go hand in hand with the ideas of the government. This is just one case, but it is super important. And that was the case of Olga Mata and her son, who uploaded a video, a funny video uh, online, where they mocked Nicolás Maduro, Diosdado Cabello, and other members of the government. In the video, Miss Mata jokingly talked about widow's arepa. You all know that arepa is a staple in the Venezuelan gastronomy, and they are usually they usually have a, a filling when they are empty. Uh, they call them the a widow's arepa, and they called it arepa Silvio, Silvia Flores, and they considered this a call to assassination. They considered that video um, a call for the assassination of Nicolás Maduro. They were forced to re um, apologize publicly. And this is a clear symptom of the fact that a citizen cannot even make an innocent joke about the government. And that right, of course, is protected by Article 13 of the American Convention. We all remember the phrase by President Carlos Ublen, who in 1937 said that the worst part was not the president mocking, uh, sorry, the government mocking the president, but the president mocking the people. And that phrase still resounds in our ears. So it is clear that whether one is in Venezuela or not, if you are a big media outlet or a small one, if you're a journalist, a human rights defender, or a regular citizen, censorship and the criminalization of free speech can reach anyone. That is why our permanent mission will continue to work with the commission and the civil society to fix the terrible state uh, Venezuela and its freedom of expression is in. Since I'm not using the allotted time, I will grant the remaining time to the civil society so they have more time to present their arguments. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We will add this to the final intervention by the civil society. Now we will begin with the presentation of the commission. First of all, I would like to ask Commissioner Arosemena, the country rapporteur, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you very much, Madam President. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to specifically recognize the work of the civil society organizations who always 
keep on investigating and analyzing and studying and really give the Mesebe and the Commission first-hand information. And this hearing, which is highly focused on freedom of expression, which I know our special rapporteur is very interested in, uh, we all want to um, share some ideas today. When I hear our friend, uh, the ambassador Gustavo Tarre, I would like to recognize his efforts, no matter the circumstances, such difficult circumstances, he and his team continue to work. They continue to work in every space available. And as a rapporteur for Venezuela, I must point out that I am so very upset when I think of how impossible it is for us to provide effective answers. When, for example, we hear about all the cases mentioned by Carlos, by the ambassador, one can't help but wonder what is the answer. Maduro's government can provide what can be done at the face of this reality. But while we have that feeling, I do still, it is very important for us to have this space to identify after listening to each case, to each situation, all the elements that are part of this crisis the Venezuelan state is in, a crisis that we know isn't just an economic crisis, but a humanitarian crisis and how it affects the lives of all Venezuelans. I would like to ask, or well, I would like to know if you can tell me about the impact that self-censorship may have. Because when the citizens or journalists or human rights defenders are doing their work, even at running the risk of losing all their properties with the rulings that are issued, we also see the other side, which is that people could, say, could think, well, let's stop speaking our mind because we are at risk. Our lives are at risk. Our properties are at risk. So what do you think is the greater the greatest impact this may have in the work that you do that the civil society organizations do those who work in the defense of human rights in the country because of these reasons that you have presented of course you know that the inter-american commission is always here for you and it's committed to uh, the mechanism and it's thankful that you are providing information because you are the sources of communication that allow us to take on our positions and to make our pronouncements so you have all of our commitment and 
especially the commitment of our special rapporteurship. That is all, Commissioner. Thank you. I will now give the floor to Commissioner Rallon, First Vice President. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon. I would like to greet the civil society and also the Venezuelan representative. First of all, I would like to express my solidarity on the dramatic testimony that we have witnessed today and the censorship that uh, the people express whenever they express their ideas. As far as I understand, the situation has worsened and the level of risk to life and to liberty just for uh, expressing against the regime goes to show that their the citizens have no rights or liberties. It's a regrettable situation. And the, there was a mention to an incident that could be seen on the social media, an aggression against Mr. Guaido, who was in an area or in a, a and I'm saying this because you expressed this in the hearing, and you've also mentioned how much more dangerous it is to think differently. This situation, this incident that took place, are there any, uh, is there any see a series of recent events that have worsened the restrictions on freedom of expression in Venezuela? That is my question. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you. Commissioner Berlan, 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 sorry, please. Yes, thank you very much, Madam President. First of all, I would like to express my thanks and my solidarity to the brave members of the civil society who are at this hearing today, and also to Ambassador Tarre and his team who have very kindly provided more information. Of course, the facts that are being reported are heinous. And I would just like to know, just to see if those attending the hearing can give us more information about these attacks on freedom of expression make it so that even in the small spaces where there can be some uh, resistance, they are losing their power too, because this is helping to the deterioration of democracy and an increase in authoritarianism. So would you like to add any more information about this in particular? Thank you. And before giving the floor to the um, Rapporteur on freedom of expression, I would just also like to remind us that Venezuela has been on chapter 4B of our annual report, which is a way to visualize this situation, which is totally regrettable. And I would also like to remember um, that liberties and human rights are not divisible, and the censorship and the restrictions on human rights lead to this human mobility, which is no longer a problem only of Venezuelans, but of the entire region. I wouldn't want to use up more time. I would like to give the floor to the Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression. Pedro, go ahead. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet the members of the commission, the representatives of the state, and uh, also uh, everyone here, I would like to start with a reflection. Um, we see a sustained example of serious violations of freedom of expression. When we talk about the criminalization process, um, especially for those who fight against hate crimes, I think it's important to say one thing. In the inter-American system throughout the years, we have seen unprotected discourse and specifically protected discourse. When we talk about unprotected discourse, we're talking about those who urge or uh, urge violence for religious reasons, for example. 
who try to protect those who might be vulnerable and or those who are in public power are not vulnerable. And what the system says is that um, it's, this usually happens that uh, these, these forces are particularly protected. So it might, it seems even perverse, right? What we understand as hate speech and when it should, when it's really protected speech, when we hear about um, criminal prosecutions for a WhatsApp status or the woman who was making a joke. And I would also like to add that then uh, she was forced to um, post a video regretting having made political uh, humor, which was a sort of public humiliation under the criminalization she had been subjected to. So I think it would be very important to reinforce that distortion, the persecution against hate speech, which is, which is something uh, embraced by the um, American Convention and the censorship exerted against those uh, who express themselves. And this is what is being done through the criminalization. We have been, we have also seen in the annual reports mentioned by the president, the um, phenomena of stigmatization, sustained stigmatization throughout the years. And I believe this has a lot to do with the self-censorship that was mentioned here. Um, being singled out or blamed as those who are powerful is something that, of course, affects the conditions of um, confidence to take part in public debate. And thank you for all this information. And uh, this is highly sensible information, but we can see this in the rest of the region. We see a deficit in uh, local democracies. And I would like to appreciate the reflections on self-censorship because it's a sort of normalization of fear, of cultural extension of fear. And I really appreciate the numbers that were presented here, the figures that start to uh, show that self-censorship is an atmosphere. And when you start breathing it, it's very difficult to overcome it. And people should feel safe enough so that they can express without fear. I would like to request information right now, if you have it handy or later, in terms of the exile, uh, the press members who, because of the persecution of the censorship, um, the, now they have had been forced into exile and now practice as journalists from abroad. And I would like to urge the states of the region who have received journalists to provide them the warranties for the press who's being persecuted in Venezuela so that they can continue to do their jobs abroad. And finally, I have a couple of questions. The first one is about the proceedings of criminalization, how long do they last? Are they affairs that are left in suspension, in, in suspense, sorry. Could you give us more information about the seizure of uh, the media outlets? You gave us one um, specific example. Now, uh, do you have any information about press stigmatization or attacks on journalists? Also, um, journalists who have been exiled, do you think they have warranties in the countries they are at now? Or have you seen persecution against the sources of those providing information of public interest? And two other ingredients. The first one is what's your um, idea with regards to propaganda? Is it growing and misinformation? Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Rapporteur. So now we will give the civil society 12 minutes plus the extra time allocated by the state. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to answer 
at least some of the questions, some of the answers we will send in written. In Venezuela, there has been an increase in self-censorship. That's true. But if self-censorship uh, has uh, both have been consolidated, we would not be able to uh, identify people who are still uh, making comments. There are people who do not accept to be silenced in spite of their serious consequences that they may suffer just because they share a message on their WhatsApp status. So first we can see that there is an increase in self-censorship because the policy that is established is to promote fear that people decide not to speak. And this is related to what I was, uh, what uh, Commissioner Arosemena was saying before. For us, it's very important. And this is one of the, uh, to understand this, one of the strategies to consolidate fear domestically and internationally, um, a lot of people say that there is nothing to do, but there is a lot of things that can be done. And when uh, internationally, people say that there are things that are that can be done, this help and supports those who are working here. And this promotes the possibilities of having a democracy and an institutional life, life, life in our country. In 1943, we see a process of modernization in the country. And this also included a process of democratization in the country. Uh, today, what we are seeing is a regression. And it's important that we keep the possibility um, and in spite of the what reporter Pedro Vaco was saying, we have displacement, we have people who are living in the country, journalists who are living in the country, but some journalists are still working in Venezuela in spite of having left. And there is a lot of mechanisms to support that. So in Venezuela, what we are seeing is um, conflict between those who want to preserve democracy and the authoritarian um, people who want uh, democracy to end. And more and more, there are a lot of people who are communicating their regressions. And we are concerned about some of the things that happened in Venezuela in the past, and now they are replicating here. This is not about solidarity. It's a way to self-protect our country in order to guarantee that there are no regressions in terms of human rights in the country. So that's why there are a lot of people who take the risk. Uh, currently, we have a lot of uncertainty in Venezuela in terms of legal proceedings. Um, you, in normal proceedings, you should have a response within two years, but a year after the beginning of the proceeding, a judge has delays it. And some proceedings are going on for over two years and there is no solution. And therefore the legal proceedings uh, are so long that sometimes you feel punished in spite of not having a resolution. And that's why it's so complicated and so uncertain. There are some cases that have been delayed for over two years. The file is no, no longer there. And sometimes people are prosecuted or sometimes they, their case has been dismissed and they are not aware of this. Um, this, the, um, the lack, um, the attacks and in the public are part of this structure. Then you have physical violence. What they are trying to do is to delegitimize, and they also uh, attack journalists who take the risk. And when a journalist is attacked, there is a lot of impunity. And this is a very serious problem because you have impunity 
And therefore, since everything is remains in impunity, um, there is no reason for not repeating the same crime. And we also see that when we started to denounce the situation of health system or when we denounce the issues regarding electricity and the electricity cuts um, and the consequences of electricity cuts in access to public information, uh, there were some engineers who were providing this information and they were persecuted. Uh, for example, nurses or engineers who account for the situation in some specific areas or persons who denounce what's happening in a state or if there is a procedure that is not correct, those people are persecuted because the law on hatred is enforced on them. They're using a legitimate standard to persecute people. Now, uh, what we are saying is that in order to persecute media outlets, uh, they use legitimate standards to protect children and adolescents. So um, the way, and also they promoted those standards, but they did not promote standards to guarantee high quality TV products. So they use other standards that are legitimate to persecute uh, and to limit or restrict freedom of expression. I hope that I have answered some of the questions. For us, a hearing like this one is very important, is very relevant for those who are supporting us. And the fear cannot be overcome alone. We need to do this together. When we support each other, our our goal is to support the journalists that raise their voice and that are being persecuted. We are here to support those peace, those people who denounce what's happening in a hospital or those who decide to uh, share their stories. And when these people are heard or are appreciated because of this, this helps them to understand that things make sense, that things are worth, are worth something so i would like to celebrate the fact that the commission has always supported us and that's what we are trying to do how we find ways so that in venezuela democracy uh remains alive and that fear is overcome is just a memory that's what we want to achieve in Venezuela, we need to overcome the fear for the consequences. We, Maria Isabel, Diego, si, would like to add, some, gracias, add eh, something? Carlos, yes, thank you, Carlos. I would like to talk about self-censorship regarding the question about the impact of self-censorship uh, and what we have started. We need to understand a key concept regarding self-censorship, and that is the fact that there is a constant fear among people, and this has created an effect. And we have discussed this a lot within the Inter-American system. The special rapporteur for freedom of expression and its office, his office has considered this. In 2017, we have identified that the dissemination of content through media outlets could create some effects that are not compatible with democracy. And also, there are a lot of sanctions based on ambiguous legal remedies in order to stop the work of journalism and social communicators. So this is related to the process of self-censorship in the press. However, over the years, uh, we have conducted every year study regarding freedom of expression, and fear goes beyond journalism. Today, citizens are, more, are feeling more and more fear 
And when we were asking about the impact, Carlos was right. Um, we see that we are seeing more fear in citizens. Citizens feel chronic fear, and people decide to get away from public participation processes in order to avoid being detained, being harassed, etc. People are aware that there are different cases and they know that expressing could be a danger. This happened to Olga Mata. The fact that she uh, commented or disseminated these elements of social media could lead to persecution by the state. And that leads to a process of self-censorship among people. And this is the impact of self-censorship. And this not only affects journalists and media outlets, but also citizens and people. And this affects the democratic principle. This is related to the question on the repeated attacks against freedom of expression. This affects democracy. Freedom of expression supports the existence of other rights and creates that there is a, a critical role in society. In a country, people decide not to participate because of their own decision, because they feel fear, and so there is no criticism. Uh, and therefore, there is a very critical situation in the country. We are seeing that this is increasing, this is affecting the Venezuelan society, and we need to continue investigating and working to avoid this. Among our requests, and we recommend the Commission and the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression to explore this issue and to try to understand this effect and how it affects indirectly freedom of expression. Clearly, there is no environment to guarantee the freedom of uh, freedom of expression and to guarantee freedom of expression. So, what happens with detention, harassment? They are a clear violation of rights by the state. But we also account for the fact that there is not an environment that promotes freedom of expression, and therefore, journalists and people in general are not able to exercise their freedom freedom of expression. With regard to the questions, I think that Carlos answered most of them, but I would like to make a final comment. In Venezuela, we are seeing that it's occurring uh, for several years. We see that um, we are seeing a lot of issues in the country, and clearly, we need to continue discussing this, the situation of Venezuela at international level. So that would be all on my end. Thank you so much. With regard to the question, regarding whether we have identified any specific characteristic that is making the situation worse, I think that there is an element that leads to an institutional and structural change. That is the change within the National Assembly, which became effective towards at the end of last year. In the administrative agenda, a group or a set of laws or bills, uh, some of them related to human rights, was included in the discussion. We are concerned because there is a parallel legislative agenda. We have the same bill on international cooperation. When you enter the page or the website of the National Assembly, the bill is not there. We learned about the project because of some informal ways. And there are several people who confirmed that they were working on this international cooperation bill. And there is also a bill on social media, media to regulate social media. That is information that is not official and at least is not included formally 
in the agenda for the legislative power. In addition, there are many things that are included formally in the agenda, especially there are some elements that have to do with human rights and these bills are being developed to justify some criminal proceedings by conducted or led by the state of Venezuela. So many of these bills are aimed at accounting for best practices in domestic or in the domestic judicial system. But we know that in spite of these proposals, uh, in real life, life, things are not working. And we know that this, there is no difference between what's happening now and what happened before in the judicial system. Also, there are other elements that I would like to mention. One of of them is the persecution of people who are sources. Carlos talked about this. This began um, when we saw an increasing number of public administration employees who were being threatened because of their public statements. We started to see this in 2017, then in 2019, and during the pandemic, this happened again. When there was no official information regarding the number of cases in the pandemic and the actions taken by the state, we saw these restrictions. And since there are restrictions on official media outlets, we see that users uh, provide information that is not present in official media. And that's why we see an increase in the number of persecutions against persons, whistleblowers, informants, especially against public officials in different bodies or structures within the country. Um, especially most of these persecutions were based on the long hatred. So they use the existing criminal code and the classification of crimes to criminalize the dissemination of information of public interest. And therefore the statement of public officials and union leaders, um, they are being persecuted for giving information. And also this happens to human rights defenders who criticize the state. So these they use a critical standard that is the prevention of hate speech. They are using this legitimate standard to criminalize journalists and civil society organizations that want to question what the state is doing. That's what they do. So that's uh, what I would like to say. Um, we see how there are different scenarios and how there has been a closing of different civic spaces and that the government, the state is using these standards in a bad way, in an incorrect way to close the spaces and to restrict the civic space in Venezuela and to restrict freedom of expression. And also there are some elements regarding um, misinformation. We know that the digital environment has been affected. Uh, although Carlos mentioned there are only 10% of digital media, it's important to mention that many citizens want to access that information, but they can't. Also, we see that there are restrictions not only on online platforms, but also on social media. There are some limitations, there are some advantages as well, but sometimes uh, there are a lot of limitations on social media. We know that there is a lot of fake information that um, spoils 
the ecosystem. And sometimes public resources are used to promote misinformation ecosystems. The state is disseminating fake information, fake news. For example, they hire, uh, they persecute um, human rights defenders, journalists, etc. But also we see that the state is using official media outlets to provide um, fake information. So there are several elements that are at play and that promote misinformation. Sometimes this includes misinformation regarding regional and global matters. And there are other fake news regarding the local context. And also we see that there are factors that are related to the state. We see that the state is using these tools to promote these misinformation mechanisms. That would be also far. And I just wanted to summarize some of the issues. Thank you. With regards to the relationship between civil and political rights and other rights, Venezuela is proof that um, the, the effects on uh, democratic stability affect ESCE rights. The sustainability of that is only possible with the progress of the rest of the rights and warranties. We work with local petitions for information to vindicate ESCE rights. And we see that the restriction um, to solve the problem of water access uh, appears there. So it's evident that the reduction in democratic spaces might have delays but it's always there. And another thing I wanted to mention was the pattern about um, the case of Miss Olga. It's a typical pattern. Public uh, disqualifications, arbitrary detentions, In sometimes they detain the families. They take their families so people will go. In this case, her son was detained. And since she went to court, she was released otherwise she would be detained and it wasn't the first case with um these degrading videos where people need to have to take back what they said we have seen many cases like this and of course these have their effects because now this woman has a process as an open process against her so she is out of prison so uh, but she does have a proceeding against her Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the civil society. Now the state has 12 minutes. Thank you, Madam President. Before um, giving the state's time to the civil society, I would just like to use uh, just a little minute to point something out. The um, Venezuela's permanent mission is receiving, continues to receive information from, uh, sorry, communications from the commission saying that we have not answered uh, petitions, even though we have done so. We have pointed this out a couple of weeks ago, but this continues to happen. There were 12 cases at the beginning of this year where we received no answer with regards to the reception of our communications, having considered that the state had responded in a timely manner. The same thing occurred to uh, two responses for precautionary measures in the past two months. And once again, we would like to say that we continue to be interest, interested in having a new meeting with you. And having said this, I will now give the rest of my remaining time to the civil society of Venezuela. Thank you, Ambassador. We take note of what you said about the answers. We will verify this with the Commission's team. And now the civil society has an extra 10 minutes should they wish to add more information. No, I would just like to speak a little more about the patterns in when it comes to uh, legal proceedings, because we litigate and we are there in the cases and we provided some details about this, but this pattern is quite classical. 
the public disqualification, the proceedings, then the detention of that person, and then opening the actual uh, judicial proceedings. Sometimes they are um, attacked on TV. Sometimes other things happen. They are attacked at a more regional level. These are persons who are persecuted at the instruction of a mayor or a governor. We saw this several times now. And the interrelationship, because over 20 years ago, we would go out and say that we were seeing some concerning signs and we would tell our colleagues and the organizations, this is risky. And something that we do see when these things happen is that when flags are raised in terms of freedom of expression or in terms of the independence of the judiciary, we need to raise all the possible flags in relation to the possible risks of the human rights situations in those countries. This is something proven by the Venezuelan experience with its cycles or anti-cycles of destruction of a greater part of the warranties of the rights of everyone living in Venezuela. Okay, if there are no more introductions, uh, sorry, more uh, presentations, we are reaching the end of the hearing. I would like to thank the state for the presentation, for their presentation, and also the representatives of the civil society, not only for being here, but because of the constant work that they do. And I would like to address all Venezuelans who are right now in Venezuela, but those who were forced to leave to reaffirm the Commission's commitment to the defense of human rights and demo the democracy. As Carlos was saying, with regards to the regressions and setbacks that there might be in the region, and this context of repeated and constant human rights violations, because one violation leads to another, and this is what happens when democracy is not respected. And you have all of our solidarity and of our and our commitment. Carlos was saying that you feel you feel accompanied by us, and we will always be there. Um, wait, by the you will be accompanied by the country rapporteur, the rapporteur for freedom of expression, the Redesca uh, rapporteur, the entire executive secretariat. This will no go, not go on forever. And what you are denouncing, all the information shows us that there are patterns, a continuity of human rights violations. And what you are doing is for today, but also for the future. And in all of that process, regardless of how much time goes by and the makeup of the commission changes, the commission will always be there for you. Uh, it was there for you before, and it will continue to be there with you through all of its tools, precautionary measures, tweets, all of our mechanisms, because what's most important here is for that hope that makes you fight and keep on moving ahead is sustained in whatever the commission can do for all of us in compliance with our mandate. So thank you once again, we will remain in touch. You will always have uh, the ears of you and the eyes of the commission. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Good afternoon. Bye-bye.